Hello, everyone, and good morning, and welcome to Semmel Grand Rounds. Today, we have Dr. Mindy, Mindy Foley-Love, who's here with a very timely talk going over the multiple pandemics that we're facing in our country right now. If you have questions for Dr. Foley-Love, make sure to use the Q&A button to submit it at any time. Also, please check your email after the presentation ends to fill out a survey for CMA credit. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Kalafanos to introduce the morning speaker. Good morning, and thanks for joining us for today's Grand Rounds. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mindy Fullylove. She's a social psychiatrist who explores the ties between environment and mental health. She received her bachelor's degree from Bryn Mawr College and her MD and MS degrees from Columbia. She completed residency at New York Hospital Westchester Division in Montefiore and is board certified in psychiatry. And she's also a, has a certificate in landscape design as an honorary member of the American Institute of Architects. With her colleagues at the city's research group and the University of Orange in New Jersey, Dr. Fully Love explores the consequences of social fracture for our society and our health and seeks ways to reconnect the broken parts. She's currently professor of urban policy and health at the New School. Prior to joining the New School full-time in 2016, she taught at Columbia University and was a lecturer at Parsons and prior to that was clinical professor of psychiatry at UCSF. She's published numerous articles and six books, including her newest title, just out, Main Street, How a City's Heart Connects Us All, The Prescient From Enforcers to Guardians, a public health primer on ending police violence that she wrote with Hannah Cooper, published in 2019. And it's, available, it's been made available for free on Project Muse, so I highly encourage everyone to Google that if you haven't already. Um, Urban Alchemy, Restoring Joy in America's Sorted Out Cities, Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It, and House of Joshua, Meditations on Family and Place. She's a true role model for those of us interested in social medicine and historically informed holistic understandings of health. Um, her talk today is entitled In These Times, A Biopsychosocial Approach to Converging Pandemics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mindy Fully Love. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I, I am just delighted to be here today, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm going to talk today about um, th this, these times, and so I'm going to share my screen, and then um, I can play this slideshow. So the biopsychosocial model is, is uh, this diagram is from a paper that George Engels published when I was like a, a second year resident in psychiatry and ma made a huge impression on me. It, before I went to medical school, I did a master's in nutrition and my master's in nutrition, which, which was at uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, was very biopsychosocial. It was, it was truly molecules to society. So they taught us about the biochemistry of nutrition, but they also taught us about uh, the ways in which the organization of society caused nutritional problems. So, and, and, and everything in between. So, so this idea of the biopsychosocial model felt very comfortable to me and, and very much something I'd been missing in my medical training. So it's something I've worked with since I first read this paper. I, I want to talk today about some of the premises that, that I work with. And so I started doing research in 1986 full time. Before that, I was working as a clinician in community psychiatry, but I've been doing research full time since then. And so over that period of time, I've worked in quite a number of communities in a number of countries. And, and one of the premises of all my work is that all health rests on social integration. This comes from Alexander Layton, who laid this out in his magnificent three-volume Sterling County study. And he defined social integration as, as the strong bonds among people in a community. So th this is surely something that's of tremendous importance. This is one of the photos from his book, People of Cove and Woodlot, one of the three volumes in that study. And it's a Sunday school class. And I think it really contains much of what I, he wanted us to think about as we were thinking about social integration. The, the connections among the teachers and the students, the, the calmness 
in which learning can take place and the, the interest that people are. People are connected to each other. Similarly, this photo from Esther Bubbly, which is taken at Hill House in Pittsburgh, a neighborhood where I've spent a lot of time, is the same kind of, of moment in the life of a community of people uh, having a calm space in which to learn and to focus. This is, this is what social integration creates and it's the basis for really all of humankind's great achievements. But in American society, stripping and sorting are active practices which are undermining social integration. So what do I mean by stripping and sorting. So stripping are the practices that take assets out of communities. And there are uh, many of these, obviously strip mining or brutal clear, clear cutting of forests come to mind as, as kind of models of this, but this goes on inside communities also. And leaves the communities really barren and destitute. So closing stores, closing, um, everything you can close, closing banks. Um, and it, these are not processes that happen once and then they never happened again. They're active practices that happen and are happening all the time. They undermine the ability of communities to hold themselves together. Part of my work has been looking at root shock what I called Ruchak, which is understanding what happens to communities as they're going through this. Um, an artist had read one of my first papers on Ruchak and then drew a, a cartoon book, which you can find on my website, ruchak.org, looking at urban renewal in the 1950s and 60s. And so she used the image of a tree that was cut down to talk about how this, how the neighborhoods were cut. And then she quoted David Jenkins, one of the people who worked with me to help me fill out an understanding of what happened in the course of urban renewal. And she quotes him as saying, losing my home and moving place to place has made it hard to trust people or feel settled. And, and trust and settlement are both part of this, part of what the individual brings to the making of social integration. This has happened so many times that our group actually tried to model this movement of going from this sort of model community with full social integration to what Leighton postulated as the opposite, a collection where just individuals and they don't have any sense that they're in it together. And in our work in Harlem and other neighborhoods, what we said was that as these policies hit one after the other, that you went through a series of stages that, in which the, the, real, the actual nature of the social organization changes as bonds are broken over and over again. There are always new ways of working, but they are distinctly different if you're in a model community versus if you're in what we called nonsense. Leighton postulated, and I, and I think all the data confirms, that morbidity and mortality rise as social integration falls. So we can't keep people well in a collapsing society. One of the ways in which we looked at this was looking at the um, processes that had undermined cities and in particular the poorest neighborhoods, urban renewal, deindustrialization, planned shrinkage, the war on jugs and gentrification. And then the, the, the sort of tsunami of epidemics, the AIDS epidemic, the crack epidemic, the violence epidemic, et cetera, that came with that. And this is, um, uh, this is, this is sort of, this is the context to what's happening in this moment that we have been taking apart communities, which weakens our cities, which weakens our society. And we have unleashed many illnesses, many new illnesses that we've never seen before. So when COVID comes along, it comes into this context. Uh, the next premise is that disaster is a centrifugal force like urban renewal, like planned shrinkage and it too rips social integration. So the policies of stripping and sorting are centrifugal policies, but so is disaster. We thought about this kind of as, a, as like breaking a glass. And then what's important is that 
on the pieces of the glass are the little fragments of people who are not connected and not able to work together anymore. This, this working together, Leighton said, was a, a really fundamental part of what a community could do, that communities that are socially integrated can problem solve. And they can, um, you know, look at a situation and say, you do this, I'll do that. And they'll get to be agreement and people will do the right thing. And one of the things that's, that's interesting as we are in this moment of COVID is the extent to which we don't have agreement and we can't get things done. So the, the last of the premises I wanted to present is that multiple crises in this moment are converging on a fragile social system. This is why people have such fears at, at this moment. Um, and as we all know, rates of anxiety and depression are going up. It's, it's sort of the, all of us understand that we're just not, we're not in good shape. We're being asked to run a marathon on a broken leg or do broken legs. So these multiple crises, I just wanna mention a few of them, but one is, is global warming. And the diagram that you see on the right is from my colleague, uh, William Morish, professor of architecture at the New School, looking at the ways in which the climate has exited what these scientists were calling the envelope of regularity. So that the reg envelope of regularity meant that the climate was predictable, it was within certain bounds, but we're not within those bounds anymore. And this is obviously related to long-term things like deindustrialization, um, but it's also related to um, the, the sort of short-term inability to say we're in dangerous territory, let's do something else. And, and that's the problem of the breaking of the bonds of the society. The second thing, crisis, is that we're in a situation where we've had now for four years an absolutely toxic president who is constantly pushing racism. Now we know that there's structural racism all the time, but the constant pushing and the endorsing of racism has created this incredible social toxicity that the whole country is suffering from. So in the aftermath of, of the murder of George Floyd, there's an explosion of anti-racist activism and the lifting up of Black Lives Matter in this moment of, of this toxicity. Uh, I think we've had a few other times in our history where there's been really widespread endorsement of racism as something that was okay in the public life. And the, uh, the outcomes have been horrific for society, certainly for black people, but also for all of society. So the awareness of it and the outburst against it is um, both remarkable and important. And then certainly we can't think about this moment without thinking about COVID. So we're in the middle of an extraordinary epidemic. This case's overview is from July 29th, 2020. Um, at which point in the county where I live, Essex County, New Jersey, there were 19,623 cases and 2,103 deaths. This diagram showed the extent to which there are excess deaths. Uh, all, this whole orange spike is composed of the reported COVID deaths and the excess deaths other than reported by COVID. So So these converging crises, climate change, the toxic racism, and the COVID pandemic are, may, are sometimes seen as separate. Yet we know that they are completely interconnected and all of them are flourishing 
and paralyzing us because they are falling on this incredibly fragile social fabric of our nation. So uh, one of the uh, aspects of my training, uh, you know, back in the day when I was at New York Hospital Westchester Division, was I had some great family therapy training. And then I was able to go to Montefiore Hospital for my last year of residency and work at Morrisania Neighborhood Family Care Center, which was um, a place that devoted all of its mental health system, had organized all of its care around family therapy. And there I was able to work intensively and be trained day after day with some outstanding family therapists. And so that gave me certainly a handle on, on families as a small social system. But we know in the biopsychosocial model that there are larger social systems. And um, what family therapy gave me was the insight that we can act at those levels. And we do. And we're talking about these outer levels, the biosphere, the society, the nation, the culture, the subculture, and the community. The uh, question is, what do, you, what do you do? And my training didn't actually teach me that, that, or my training in residency. That's sort of the set of tools that I've learned in the years since, having had the opportunity to work with urban planners and architects in the United States and um, in France. So, but I want to say in the spirit of, of theologian Barbara Holmes, who writes that even as a member of an oppressed community, you're always an individual. But during a crisis of this magnitude, you do not have the luxury of responding as an individual. This suffering cannot be absorbed by individuals, no matter how tenuous and invisible the bonds of community are. Individuals cannot respond. You must do it as a community for safety, for comfort, and for survival. And I, I think that's really the spirit of looking at these outer layers that, that individuals can't manage this on their own. We have to pull together as community. In my, um, my opportunity to work with all these planners and architects, I learned the science of cities, which helps us to understand these systems. And one of the schematics that was presented by urbanists it developed actually some decades ago is this little schematic with the triangle at the top of government and policymakers and then organizations of all kinds, which includes the businesses, the nonprofits, the teams, the clubs, the work groups, every organization you can think of, organization writ very broad. And then the people who are grouped into communities by the things they have in common. This, this is more or less a schematic of the social systems of the city. In my thinking and, and in working with my colleagues at the uh, city's research group, we argued and we have hypothesized that organizations which are the mesh of the city are the key for understanding what to do. We have hypothesized that effective mobilization of organizations can support social, emotional, and economic recovery of the whole, of the whole thing. And after 9-11, we did a great deal of work creating an organization called NYC Recovers. And basically, as we thought this through with the many organizations who partnered with us, we elaborated what we call four tasks and three directions. That the, the four tasks that organizations take on in a crisis to support social and emotional recovery are remember, respect, learn, and connect. But we also realized that organizations work they're the, they're the middle mesh and they work in three directions. They work with other organizations, they work with the policymakers, and they work with the community. So if we can teach organizations how to do these four tasks in these three directions, we can mobilize them to hold the society together so that it moves through crisis in, in as you know, as strongly as possible, as clearly as possible, caring for the whole. This is how we give the communal support to the people. And I, we think it's not surprising that actually organizations know this to some extent, many do, and they all are asking what is ours to do. So some of the examples that were in my email, uh, Jezra Kay, who's a 
great business coach, said that she wanted to share some thinking, not about the uprising, but about being white and what white people tend to miss. Um, Arise, which is part of, it's, it's the sort of uh, people of color in Thich Nhat Hanh's Buddhist lineage, said that they wanted to offer a call to love and action, a call to the living and engaged Dharma. Designing Justice and Designing Spaces, a design team, shared this rendering for the future of the Atlanta Center for Equity, so designs to eliminate the local jail and end mass incarceration. One of my favorites, Sam Sifton of the New York Times, said that, um, the New York, that the, even New York Times cooking looks at everything through the prism of home cooking, but that they also had a take on what did this mean in these times? And my alma mater, Bryn Mawr, talked about acknowledging the college's racist history and thinking about sustainable paths forward with some very specific actions that they intended to take. One of the most important organizations, coalitions, pulling us together is the Poor People's Campaign for a Moral Revival, which is um, doing building the political power of poor and low wealth people and their allies to create a whole new voting bloc that can energize this election season. This, these kinds of actions help us to get to reconnection, which is the goal of collective recovery. And we believe that the only way forward is together. So the diagram on the left of the sort of blown apart triangle of the city, we want to transform into this more connected, with all these lines of connection going among all of the pieces. This is our goal. And so the, the question I think has to be answered that, well, what would make people do that? When we've been in the process of, of, we're so imbued with racism, we've been in this toxic racist atmosphere, uh, we are very broken and divided. We're not really looking out for each other. What would be the centripetal motivation? And so two, there are others, but two that I think are really worth emphasizing are American love of fairness and saving our children. So the, after 9-11, there was a child psychologist who gave a talk to some parents at one of the schools, which was near Ground Zero. And he said that in, in a crisis, people move apart. But one of the things that pulls people back together is that we organize for our children. And so these kinds of centripetal motivations help us to, to pull together. There was quite an extraordinary wrapping that came with my morning paper, the New York Times today. And it was in honor of women's history, but it was a collection of posters. And the posters all said things like uh, lifting up, you know, lifting up everyone and we're all in this together. And it was put out by Mutual of Omaha, which was trying to emphasize mutuality. Uh, now, I, Aside from the profit motive, uh, I just want to emphasize that, that for them to make this full color wrapper for the New York Times is in the spirit of centripetal motivations, that understanding that if we're going to survive, we have to come together. I think it was quite an extraordinary act by Mutual of Omaha, and maybe it was Mutual of Massachusetts, um, and really, really worth pondering how do we get more organizations to say, there, there's something we have to do in this crisis. What is it and how do we work with others to get it done? This is a, a photograph from Washington Heights I, where um, I was at Columbia University Medical Center for many years. And one of the projects that my team worked on was a project we called City Life is Moving Bodies. And we were working in parks that had been abandoned. Um, and were in actually really dangerous parks and dangerous not only if you went in the park, but the danger in the park would come out and attack you and then run back in uh, quite a mess. We wanted to 
get the parks working again. We were working with a Center for Children's Environmental Health at Columbia, Univer at Columbia University, and they helped us. We worked together to pull together this event, which is called Hike the Heights. Now, at that time, we just, you can see, we had this stroller hike. So you see all the babies. The Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health was doing a study with mothers and babies to all these babies. And basically, the moms pushed the stroller around a very big circle. But it was the beginning and it was the, the wish for the babies to have a nice park to play in that brought people out year after year after year and led to advocacy for that park and other similar parks in minority neighborhoods in New York City. Um, and eventually, you know, more than $150 million in investment to restore the parks and make them functional. The inequity in the parks in New York City is, is still horrific. But this was an example of using this wish for solidarity and, and the caring about children as a centrif centripetal motivation to pull us together and to help us work together. And you can see on the back of the t-shirts all but for many decades in the face of other crises. I started my research career in 1986, looking at the AIDS epidemic. And um, one of the things that happened at that time was that the government refused to act on AIDS. So it's not, not I mean, there's just definitely distressing similarities between now and the ways in which the government has really refused to act sensibly on this pandemic. So I, I want to show you a, a little short video of about solidarity. So how do I explain to this audience, I only have 10 minutes and how do I talk to them about solidarity? And she said, um, and solidarity is the, this eighth element of urban restoration. She said, tell them about Ryla, um, which I thought was a great honor because this is her story and I've never been allowed to tell her story before any of her stories. So Ryla is Rotary Youth Leadership Awards and she was selected um, from Bergen County Outstanding Teenagers, 124 of them, to go to a youth leadership camp for a week in Pennsylvania. And at this camp, they were immediately organized into teams which were thought of as families. And in these families, they, they had their primary support system and they did a huge amount of activities every day. So, you know, youth building, you know, they had to go on a ropes course and do all usual kinds of trust building activities. But the teams were also doing things very quickly and trying to accomplish things. And the teens had the sense that their families were competing among each other. A little bit of family feud going on in the, if you remember that TV show. So the families were competing with each other. On the next to the last day, they had a long series of activities, which began with each family receiving a pile of things like plastic bags and duct tape and cardboard and having the assignment to make a boat. Once they'd made the boat, they had to row the boat across a river to get an egg. Once they had the egg, they had to come back. And then they could do a series of other challenges to get materials to create some kind of a holder for the egg so they could drop the egg from a roof. So they had three hours to do all these challenges, collect these materials, get the egg, drop it from the roof. At the end of doing that, and her egg broke, um, her team, her family's egg broke, they got a certain number of tiles, foam, those foam floor tiles that interlock. And then they were all taken to the gym. So this is the gym. Um, and in the gym, each family was put on an island. They're marked in tape. Um, and then they were given a list of instructions. The instructions were, you have to get to the left, the island to the left of you by going to the right, which meant you had to go all around the entire circle. And the second instruction was, you can't put your foot outside of the parts that were marked as islands was rushing water. And if your foot went in there, your foot was taken away and you never got it back. 
and also the foam tiles which they could step on in the water would rush away if there wasn't something holding them down. Some teams, for what they thought, who thought they had won, were given large numbers of tiles, and some teams who thought they had lost in the egg drop in the previous competitions were given small numbers of tiles. Complete chaos ensued in the gym for about two hours, until somebody said, because what happened was people didn't have enough tiles, they got washed away, and then teams wouldn't be able to move and they would be stuck. But if one team couldn't move, nobody moved. And then suddenly somebody said, "Oh, we have to cooperate." And <laughs> And、then it took another hour to figure out how to cooperate, but finally, what turned out was that every, you had to share the tiles. That it wasn't who has the most toys win. Everybody needed a tile to move, and the whole room had to be moving in a continuous chain to get everybody onto the island to the left of them by going to the right. The Rila counselors said afterwards, "We, all of us, are one team, one pulse, one Rila, and we, all of us, are one team." One pulse, one America. Thank you. Um, yeah. So、uh, that was a story of my granddaughter,、um, who is now a senior in college. And so, with that, I'd like to open it up for、uh, questions or comments or chat or. Uh, whatever. Thank you so much for your attention. So thanks a lot, Dr. Fully Love.、Um, so we are, as we wait for questions to come in,、um, you know, one way I thought we'd maybe get the question and discussion、um, period kicked off is, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about. You know, a, a lot of our audience is, is clinicians、uh, across you know mental health disciplines, and, and you really your talk really was was nice how it really did span this、um, you know the way you started out. I was thinking about from from the molecular level to the sort of more global level.、Um, you know, what do you what are your some sort of what do you tell clinicians、um, you know who you know are, do a lot of their work in、um, one on one patient care. Um, in、um, you know working in clinical practice,、um, what's your advice to them when they ask you know well what can I do to sort of move in this direction of, of building broader social solidarity、um, in, in the ways you're pointing to?、Uh, thanks so much for that question. I, I I say to them the same thing I say to everybody, which is that we all have a job. Like my job is to teach, and so it's sort of. Collective recovery is in addition to my job. I think for many of us, I am a member of organizations, and so the issue is, can I get the organizations that I participate in to ask what is ours to do, and then having asked that to to begin to say, how can we take on these four tasks and working in these three directions? So I'm a member of an organization in Orange, New Jersey, called the Healthy Orange Coalition. Which, which is already a coalition of organizations, and、uh, we said, well, why don't we work on helping people wear masks? Like in the beginning, we said people need to make masks because masks weren't widely available, if you remember March and April.、Mm -hmm. So we made a video, sort of how to how to make a mask, making a mask and wearing it. And then now we're doing a mask campaign. But just we asked ourselves, what could we do to help? And that was our answer. And and I think it's a really good way to start is just to say what are all the organizations I'm part of, where do I bank, where do I shop, what's my supermarket, what clubs am I a part of, are you part of the APA chapter,、um, and and then for each of those organizations to say, with your the other people in that organization, what's ours to do, so I I think that's the way we all start. And you know everybody's so nervous. People are glad when you ask the question and you give that direction, and so it 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 takes off pretty fast.、Mm -hmm. And you know, another I think another、um, of、uh, powerful、uh, metaphor that you use that I really appreciate and I find kind of really resonates 
is this um, is the idea of of the social integration on the one hand and practices of stripping and sorting um, on the other hand. Um, and, and, and those practices of stripping and sorting sort of actively undermining social integration. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious um, in thinking about that dynamic um, and thinking about the role medicine has had and psychiatry has had in, in, in both of those processes. Um, as we think about, you know, what is our thing to do as, as you know, health practitioners um, today, um, you know, what, what's been the role of sort of, of medicine, of, of healthcare in social integration and stripping and sorting historically in this, this sort of expansive historical perspective that you've given us? And what are some of the sort of ways forward that really um, can push us more towards uh, a medicine that, that builds social integration much more? I don't know if that's too abstract. <laughs> no, 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 it's really right to the point. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the things we're thinking about is that the biomedical model itself is a kind of stripping and sorting because it, it extracts the human being from the social setting. So I, I, that could be one of the greatest harms that our profession has done is to stop looking at the, at the big picture. I, I think I was lucky that I trained in one of the last psychoanalytic residencies and, and the psychoanalysts thought big and they talked about society. They had no hesitance of saying, you know, what they thought were the psychodynamic issues of the society. And that was fun and instructive. They, they didn't take the person out of the society. So that's a great harm, but there are other more specific harms. In urban renewal, for example, medical centers were one of the places that were given land by the government. So there are many medical centers that expanded and the medical centers basically haven't stopped knocking down neighborhoods to expand. So that's a, a second kind of harm. Um, and then, you know, looking at, at positives, how have we promoted social integration? I think that uh, when you think about, there are lots of ways in which people have created movements, like the whole community mental health movement was really about how can, how can working in a community to support community mental health be supportive of, of social integration? I, you know, I came to California right after Prop 13 had killed most of the funding for community mental health. Um, and, and much of that had been decimated. But it was very much, it was meant to be about this social integration. So I, I think you can see both in our professions. And the trick is to, to build up the, so, the, the forces of social integration. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of what I was thinking as well. So, so there's sometimes a dynamic in the medical model of uh, definitely sorting, categorizing, um, and that, that many point to as, as dehumanizing, as, as divisive. And while a lot of these are tools that actually can help us, you know, um, identify um, ways to help people, um, we, I think, taking care to be sure they don't cause more division um, and less cohesion. Yeah. Um, so, so here, a question, one of the questions that's coming in from the audience, um, what do you consider to be the most critical lessons learned regarding solidarity and the HIV epidemic that we can now apply to COVID? You, you kind of alluded to some resonances. Um, and I think we'd be interested in hearing a, a bit more about, about the, the resonances that you see there and that particularly in terms of lessons that we may apply today. Yeah, take care of Anthony Fauci, um, <laughs> for sure. Um, that's a really great question. The, you know, it, the, lack of, the lack of solidarity and the lack of government leadership are of course tragic in the AIDS epidemic because there's so many excess deaths and it becomes a driver of the worldwide AIDS epidemic because we aren't taking care of it here in the US and so just allows it to spread. Nobody's ever figured out how many millions of deaths are due to that, but, it, but it's many millions of deaths. This is very tragic. So lessons of solidarity. Um, I mean, again, that organizations could make changes. So we did a, a study of response to AIDS in Alameda County and went to different organizations all the nonprofits who were involved in AIDS and said, you know, how'd you get started? What are you doing? And 
the sad part about getting started was they were so slow. But the, but the important part for this thinking about collective recovery and the role of organizations was that they did ask themselves, what is ours to do? So I, I think as soon as that conversation opens, then people start to see, oh, I, I'm going to do this piece. I'm going to deliver care to my constituents, maybe the Hispanic community. But I also need to work with other people to advocate for more resources. So bridges were built through um, conferences. The AIDS conferences were incredibly important in the building the field um, and, and creating that solidarity. I think things, you know, arts projects, the AIDS quilt built solidarity. So many things that people invented coming from this question, what's mine to do, helped to build that solidarity over time. On the one hand, we feel like we don't have that kind of time in the face of COVID. But on the other hand, this is just the beginning of of profound crisis from climate change. We had a storm off the coast of New Jersey, which was Kyle, and it was the earliest K, st K storm, storm starting with a K, to ever in history. Katrina, 2005, was the previous earliest, and that was end of August. So we're in such trouble on so many fronts that we, we can build, so we have time to build solidarity. As it, and, and that's another lesson from AIDS, it takes time. And I think another related question that's actually uh, is it flows nicely from this discussion that you've started. Um, is there a place for teaching community organization um, in terms of I think, teaching community organizing in medicine and psychiatry as there is in social work and social psychology? I think you were right the first time it says community organization. organization. Okay, thank you. I don't we, know what they mean. But they're slightly, I mean, I would interpret them as slightly different. Community organizing is how to organize the community. Community organization is how our community is structured. And um, I mean, I, I wouldn't be true to my field if I didn't say, I think everybody should read Alexander Leighton. Uh, his work is extraordinary. And I think it gives us a sound foundation for uh, all of the work that we imagine and that we should be doing. Um, uh, just as a foundation, and then there's lots of other things. Um, I, I was um, basically was teaching trauma in the residency. This is probably 20 years ago at Columbia, but the residents were like, no, we need to learn more neuropsychiatry. So I was, that was the last time I ever taught a resident. So that's terrible. It's just ridiculous. Uh, read the journals. They got all the neuropsychiatry. It was, some other things you got, the biopsychosocial model is bigger than that. That was a message from our sponsor. I think you'd enjoy teaching our residents these days. Um, <laughs> and I think we'd enjoy your, when we would enjoy and are enjoying your, your teaching right now. Um, I think going back to your experience um, in New York with the AIDS epidemic, um, what was the role? I, I, uh, we got a question about the role of also the advent of crack um, during the H H HIV epidemic and its, its role in this racialized sorting and stripping process. Yeah, hi, Philippe. Um, uh, yeah, so crack epidemic, as you and I both watched it, was one of those like tsunamis of chaos through the neighborhoods. Um, all of a sudden, people were going to jail, kids were going into foster care, there was sexually transmitted diseases, there was all this violence, there were gangs, there was murder. It was just like, <laughs> exploded like that. You could, you could see the community being torn apart by the, by the epidemic. And, um, you know, we, we said to people, what are you going to do? Um, and I had a conversation with a guy at NIDA who's like, well, we've just really perfected a way to get a census of how many people are heroin addicts. That was an answer to the question, what are you going to do about crack? Um, so they didn't, they, what they did was mass incarceration, which did greater harm. So uh, the, the whole terrible experience of the crack epidemic, which comes on top of other stripping and sorting uh, was, man, really a breaking point for a lot of neighborhoods, as Philippe knows and has written about so brilliantly. And um, I think following on the theme of stripping and sorting, um, there's a question about um, if you could speak to the ways you have seen the child welfare system contribute 
or not to the stripping and sorting issue that you've mentioned? Um, and, and has this improved, changed at all in, in recent years? I wouldn't want to say I'm an expert on Oops, I think uh, you froze there, Dr. Fully Love. There we go. Okay, you're back. We missed awesome. all that. <laughs> I didn't say anything. You said okay. I froze. I, oh, good, I just... good. Thanks. <laughs> but you're back now. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the paradoxical things that's happened is uh, we undermine the foundation of community and then we put in services. And th that's the tail wagging the dog. Uh, services cannot do not build community, cannot build community, cannot solve the problems that have to be solved by community. And uh, then we defund the services. So, because the services aren't working. So it's really a catch 22, but it's the wrong direction. And if we, if we want strong communities, we have to build strong communities. And that means there has to be stability. We have to stop the stripping and sorting processes. And, and that's the, and no, I haven't seen any improvements recently. If you think about what COVID is doing to poor communities, uh, it's, you know, complete utter horror. Um, and then I think related, I think related to the, the question, the issue of services um, and, and sort of contemporary times, um, how does the need to fundraise interact with the goals of a social organization? Does it make sense to cooperate with entities that may have resources but are not necessarily aligned with the goals of the organization? Um, in, in a moment like this, think about the Democratic National Convention that's going on. It's the big tent that's really got the answers. You have to build very broad coalitions. And so how do you build a coalition? You have to find common cause. I, I don't think you should work with somebody where you're completely opposed, but I don't think you can say, have a checklist. It's not a purity test in, in a big, big tent coalition. It's sort of, what are we going to work on together? And you don't work on coalitions, the, the same partners with for everything. You work some things with these people and some things with these people. I think coalition building is very pragmatic. Uh, but especially in a crisis. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I think this does speak to sort of politics of purity versus pragmatism and, and build the yeah. need to build coalitions. Um, and, and so I think another, this is a, I think we're getting a nice discussion going here with the questions. Um, the next one is in the current national climate, it appears that the hyperpolarization of politics has really brought to light many of the problems in society and, and many of the barriers to social integration and, the, and the, maybe the, the holes in, in, the, in the social fabric. Do you think that times of crisis, disaster are necessary to move the population forward? Um, and, and maybe we might add, um, how can we um, sort of take advantage of this, the, the awareness that these disasters and crises bring up to really push things forward? Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, they say crisis is danger plus opportunity. So, and family therapy, you know, sometimes the only time the family will come in is in crisis. And then you got to move fast and do whatever you can do to try to realign things while they're in the crisis so that they resettle in a new formation. Um, but, you know, all of family therapy is not trying to provoke a crisis, you'd like to avoid the crisis because there is danger. Um, think how many hundred thousands of people are going to die in this COVID pandemic. So I, I think the, and uh, I think the issue is that, that um, Miles Horton, who is a founder of the Highlander School, folk school in, in the South, which was a school for union and, and civil rights organizing, said that there are periods when you're organizing and then there are periods when there is movement. So a movement time. So right now around, for example, Black Lives Matter, we're in a movement time, but there's a lot of organizing that goes on in between those periods. So I think it, it, it's better to see both as productive, that if you've done solid organizing 
teaching people how the system works and teaching people to name their problems. Then when you go into a crisis, you you have the, the some thing to build on. You have some structure. You have some forces that are ready to move at that time. If, if you haven't, then you're in bad shape. So we have to organize all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the crisis as the opportunity to then to, to move um, and, and, and to sort of, and to act. Uh, you're supposed to act in a crisis, yes. I mean, you have to, right? And so a, a question on, you know, um, your work, you have been based on sort of the um, West Coast and East Coast um, for, for mu much of your career, most of your career. Um, and, and we have a question asking to reflect on um, sort of different experiences on the, uh, from New York to California in terms of being a public health practitioner, researcher, teacher. Um, different, I guess, asking about different dynamics on, on, on the two sides of the coast or, or similarities. Well, I wasn't in those places at the same time. So, and, and I was in the Bay Area uh, 86 to 90 doing research. So that was a long time ago. So I'm not sure I'm really able to, uh, and they're very different. But so some things that, uh, that I noticed that were different, um, I mean, the Bay Area is not, not black. And the black people that were in San Francisco have been pushed out. So what is it now? 4% of the population is black. Whereas New York City is, is a, you know, a minor, majority minority city. So the dynamics are different. And so one occupies a, a different space and the issues are different. And New York City had aggressively pursued really destructive policies of plant shrinkage, urban renewal that had literally destroyed inner city minority communities. Um, so at the time I got there in the midst of the crack epidemic, it, it, it was in great painful turmoil. Um, and as that started to quiet down, we got gentrification. So the, it's more black, but, but New York City as a whole is very, is against minority people and against white people. Those are the forces, I'm sorry, against poor people and against people of color. So Manhattan is becoming this citadel of white people. Um, so it's, they're, they're very different dynamics. And I, I think it's a good thing about working in different parts of the country is you get to see different kinds of dynamics that are going on, driven by some of the same forces, but sometimes other unique things. I see a question here, how can we develop more Anthony Fauci's in medicine? And I think that is a really great question and probably the question of our era. I, I think he's just an amazing, one of a kind guy. How does he do that? How does he tolerate it? Uh, he's so smart. He's so calm. God bless him. How well, lucky were we that he's still there? Fauci played a different, was a different character in the AIDS epidemic, though, wasn't he? He was much more controversial. Um, I may be misremembering this, but the point is he was there and he listened to people. And invited them in. So people stormed the, the Citadel, but he said, okay, come on in. He listened to them. Yeah, that's right. He that's listened right. to them. That's right. And that's he right. learned and he grew. That's right. So yeah, he, and maybe that's the real answer to the question is, how do we become people who open the door? Yeah, a humil and a certain amount of humility that, and, that yes. he's shown. Yeah. I yeah. don't know that he has humility. I, don't <laughs> I just remember in the AIDS epidemic, initially, you know, uh, you know, especially the gay community was very unhappy with how, with the lack of response, and he was often the target a lot of a lot of the criticism. And I hear you saying is he, but he he opened the door, he changed, and he he, he listened. Did. Yeah. yeah, but I think he he was able to change from a position of real confidence in his skills and his knowledge, and his power. And um, I think another really nice question has come. Looking globally, um, are there countries? that you feel have done better with social integration than the US? And are there lessons there that, that we might learn and, and think about applying? Um, uh, yeah, quite a few countries have done better than the US. We've done terribly. <laughs> We're really bad. <laughs> um, look at all the countries that have done a good job with COVID. 
and they did a good job. They have done a good job with social integration. So, and are there lessons? Yes, so social integration is the foundation of health. It's the foundation of the economy. It's the foundation for problem solving. Nobody in the world has the answers to how we're gonna survive climate change. Nobody does. But if we can talk to each other, if we can do what Fauci did, open the door, bring, bring everybody in, bring all the voices to the table, we will find a best possible way forward. So it's the only way forward. And we're in terrible shape. So uh, ask all the organizations you're part of to take a piece of it because we can put it back together. Great. Well, maybe that is the note that we should end on. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Foley Love. I, I, really inspiring, and it's it's a, a treat to kind of to hear you, the trajectory of your work and your career, and, and it's really inspiring the way you, you kind of really do weave in a lot of these um, really global perspectives, and and I think kind of pointing us to to really the the directions we need to think about um, and sort of fundamental. Um, levels of health in terms of social integration and 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 just how can we work together and and um, and move forward. So, thank you um, for a truly inspiring and wonderful talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>